Marcelo Mena is an environmentalist and a scholar, and he is the former Minister of Environment for Chile. Welcome, Marcelo. Hey, how you doing, Whitney? Thanks for great, the invitation. Great. Of course, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, and you know, before we dive into the future of climate action um, in Chile and beyond, I think it would be great for us to talk about sort of the present and why Chile really represents a, a country that uh, is, is worth thinking about when we talk about, about climate. Um, you know, recently there have been lots of commendable actions um, taken by your country uh, when we think about climate. Uh, you're, Chile recently uh, committed to net zero emissions by 2050, the first in the Americas to do this. And that's especially notable when you think about how much of Chile's economy really depends on carbon emissions, you know, mining and agriculture and spaces like that. So could you start a little bit by just talking about how, how would this even be possible to get to net zero emissions in 30 years? And what would that, what would that mean for Chile? Mm -hmm. It was a very surreal um, image when we saw um, Minister Schmidt, uh, the COP25 president, Patricia Spinoza, the UN head on climate change with masks, uh, having and delivering this new NDC. The important thing here is things that are hard to build require consensus, but therefore to get rid of that consensus, uh, the, uh, get rid of that commitment, you need to have another consensus. And this hasn't happened. So the thing is, the reason why Chile uh, has this sort of vision towards mitigation uh, that's ambitious is that we see that there's a big economic benefit. We have seen, we witnessed what the renewable energy sector has been able to do for investment, for lowering, lowering energy costs. And so therefore, uh, to reach this goal, we will inevitably expand to 100% renewable, but we'll also transform our industry, which is heavy on fossil fuels towards uh, low emissions with the hydrogen economy kicking in with a recently launched committee that I formed the minister, uh, Jovet, uh, the minister of energy set up and also um, energy efficiency and a lot of capture, carbon capture. We have, uh, we are endowed with a lot of natural capital taking care of that natural capital and expanding plantations will allow us to reach net zero by 2050. That's great. I mean, and it, it, now it seems like Chile has such a huge focus then in you know thinking about renewable energy and thinking about climate, but this wasn't always the case. Could you talk a little bit, I guess, about the history of how Chile arrived at this moment? Yeah, so in 2011, 2010, um, we had um, an energy discussion with incumbents saying the only way we could solve our energy problems will be through large coal and large hydro in the Patagonia. And that really polarized the discussion. We got together as a community uh, after large protests that triggered a lot of social movements. Um, and we started discussing how we should be able to do our energy going forward. The population, public unrest, uh, set up almost 6,000 megawatts of coal-fired power plants to never be built. And uh, mm -hmm. when the government, Michelle Bachelet's government came in, we pulled the plug on Hydro Aysen project, which is a big hydro project in the Patagonia. And both of these conditions enabled an opportunity for renewable energy to set in. We put in carbon taxes, we put in uh, environmental regulations, and we set up uh, an energy strategy that we did building on discussing, uh, looking at the data in which we uh, thought that the 70% renewable energy by 2050 was going to be a target that we could agree on. This target has been uh, long surpassed. Now we're thinking of reaching that same goal by 2030. Great. And, you know, I, I think in what you were saying is about social protests, that's something that a lot of people who maybe have been following news and what's going on in Chile are, are familiar with recent social protests. And, and I, I think I'm, I'm curious about how you see that factoring into climate action moving forward. How might these social protests um, play a, a role in what climate action you see? And, and really, you know, how is it possible for Chile to sort of be a leader in climate action while also struggling with some of these, um, these social issues? Well, the, the social issues, which are very profound and important to address, uh, caused, for example, COP25 to not be able to be held in Santiago to go to uh, Madrid. And this also shifted a whole bunch of the discussions and announcements that weren't uh, done and we were expecting to have. But uh, regardless of this, uh, the fact that we have this commitment uh, from, uh, from the government today shows that there's a resolution to continue forward. But really, uh, the, the, the model, the economic model of Chile was uh, brought into, into question because um, the environmental issues, for example, uh, are, are widespread 
and many times you have large coal-fired power plants uh, being situated where uh, people live and with higher mortality rates. You know, somebody lives where a power plant uh, is installed has a, the, twice the, the, the rate of uh, death uh, in comparison to other people in Chile. So the model of having many people uh, be impacted for the benefit of few is something that caused and triggered the social unrest. And it goes into the economic model itself of extracting polluting, impacting communities and that may not see the benefits of these economic activities. So while we've done a lot, we've come a long way, for example, in securing a, a, a very emblematic agreement to phase out coal-fired power plants, many people feel that this wasn't done fast enough and want this action to be brought uh, faster. And it sounds like having people who sort of be the voice and the, the engine behind making that happen is, has really been part of this historical thread with climate action um, in Chile and, and, and seems like it would really sort of lead things moving into the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, we, so it's, we, we will continue. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Oh, go oh, ahead. Please, go ahead. please go ahead. It's our, we have, and no, for I mean, everyone, we have a little bit of a delay. Going forward, we're going to be, we, you know, this is a starting out. We've, we've, we are doing well, but I think we need to double down our commitments. And so e even though we have ministries involved, we have a so civil society involved, we need to bring in the mainstream uh, industry. Uh, I think, for example, the mining sector has a great opportunity to be the solution for the environmental issues because we provide the copper, the cobalt, the lithium that are required for solar PV panels for, for uh, battery storage. But we need to do this in a clean manner. I think this is the biggest challenge we're going to have the next 20 uh, years ahead. Um, and, you know, sort of pivoting to the pandemic and to thinking about what's going on right now, the entire world has obviously been devastated by this crisis. You know, what have been some of the unique challenges that Chile has faced uh, in, during this pandemic? Well, definitely, as anybody, we've, we, we are all, always struggling within uh, taking actions today to prevent a deeper impact in the future. And we started off pretty well. Pretty, you know, pretty well. We shut off uh, schools. We shut off uh, different um, uh, cities and had uh, quarantine. But we let off. Uh, we gave the wrong signals to people, and we didn't have a consistent effort. And this has brought us to have the highest uh, infection rates per capita in the world these days. So this goes to show that we the same parallel with climate change. We need to take action now to prevent deeper impact later. And I think uh, we need to take the lesson of this uh, to continue uh, uh, with a, with an effort. Because one thing is to announce an uh, ambitious NDC. Another thing is to invest and do the regulations that you require to turn this into reality. But there's some things that are interesting. The pollution in Santiago, which is one of the most polluted capitals historically in Latin America, has dropped substantially. The car-related emissions are down almost 80 to 90 percent, which is pretty substantive. Uh, and if we look at the example of what's going on, uh, Har Harvard University showed a study in which they showed higher mortality rates for more polluted cities. And this is also the case in Chile. For every microgram of pollution, PM 2.5, there's an increase of the fatality rate, 9%. But the thing is, we could also look back at what we've achieved up to now. Had we not taken measures to clean the air as we've done so in Chile these last 20 years, we would be talking about five times more people would have died from COVID. We have around 800 people that, uh, that have died uh, due to COVID directly, but this had been much higher had we not taking action. And in fact, due to the lower pollution, if we estimate and project this to the, to, the, um, to the rest of the year, we will have saved as many lives reducing the pollution as we have lost in COVID, showing that there's a pandemic that we also need to address, which is the crisis on air pollution that uh, suffocates many cities in the world. And, and it seems like that's probably something that we're seeing in other areas around the world as you're as you're suggesting with this air pollution is a problem everywhere. Um, and, you know, I'm curious also how these challenges that you've mentioned and, and maybe others um, might hinder or help uh, some of this progress that you're hoping to make uh, towards climate action. You know, what, what, how do you see this factoring into some of the decisions that might be made going forward in, in Chile and beyond? Okay, so we have a higher fatality rate in more polluted cities, and we have a climate action to carry out. This is going to be a decisive decade in which we need to lay the groundwork for our lower emission strategies. So whatever we do today cannot lock us into a 
incompatible climate future. We need to, to lay the groundwork for this low emissions transition. So therefore, a green recovery efforts need to be done as Kristalina spoke last week, uh, has to be uh, related to a green recovery that creates job immediately, that addresses the, the, the poverty issues that we have on energy today in the Southern Chile. And we need to use this for expanding renewable energy and expanding the successful efforts that we've done on electromobility. Today, we have the largest free of electric fleets of electric buses outside of China, and but we could actually make this go even bigger because we've seen that the reductions in cost uh, have been almost 70% in comparison to diesel buses. So we should use this opportunity to expand. And multiple uh, stakeholders are working. We're working together to call on the government to do a green recovery, to use the green bonds that we've already issued and under which we've gotten really low uh, rates uh, for, for, for interest rates to do and fund cleaning the air, clean the transportation, and letting the ground work for a cleaner tomorrow in the mining sector, which is our biggest challenge uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the way that you sort of think about and conceptualize climate action, um, you know, have you, have you personally had any changes to your thinking um, just as a result of what you're seeing uh, through this pandemic? Yeah, I think we, we start looking around, everybody had to uh, struggle and find uh, that we could do much more with less and keeping a full economy that requires you to buy an extra t-shirt that you don't need. Uh, the fact that we're using three times more, more, um, more clothes than we were maybe 20 years ago shows that we are uh, blowing up an economy that requires us to destroy the environment in a way to continue to, to uh, forward. And the food system is going to be probably our biggest challenge. And I, and, you know, even though I've been working with electric buses and with electromobility and, and just the more, the, the, the more conventional mitigation, I think our biggest cultural challenge will be to talk about how our food decisions impact the way that we, uh, the, the, you know, the, the way that we will have a future. Nature just put out a, a, a report that showed something, you know, when we were in the government, what we had talked about. When Chile was good in soccer, we started going deeper in the, into the wintertime uh, summer, uh, the, the wintertime contest. And we started winning games. But to win those games, we started doing a lot of barbecues. And the paper that came out showed something that, you know, when we, when we explained this to people that you guys are messing up the air with uh, barbecues, people thought we were crazy. Well, nature now shows, the nature report shows that we actually um, fouled the air and destroy the air, annihilate the air, because we wanted to, to celebrate the soccer. And we set this up to people, and people thought we were crazy. Now people acknowledge the fact that the, the basic thing that you could do, such as the way that you choose how to cook, could actually impact your air. So I think that uh, going forward, um, I, this cultural challenges that we need to do, we need to tackle them head on. We need to show the evidence. Otherwise, we're just going to be ignoring problems and letting them perpetuate for the future. And you know, for nations who have not really prioritized climate in the in the same way that Chile has, um, are there lessons that you think can be learned from some of the choices that Chile has made in recent years that other nations can apply, or and how could could folks in other countries implement uh, some of these strategies that you that you've implemented in Chile? So many people in the U.S. and across the world know about the Chilean sea bass. The Chilean sea bass is uh, it was overfished and almost collapsed. One of the things that we did under the support from National Geographic and with the leadership of President Bachelet was to expand marine protection from 4% of our oceans to 43% within one government, which is the large, largest leap that, uh, that is only comparison to the U.S. Uh, during Obama in terms of uh, protection. And this is because we want this uh, population also to recover. You know, when you let the, 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 the park, uh, uh, you know, stop fishing, the, the overflow from the fishing will actually increase the biomass sixfold. So I think, you know, one of the efforts that we need to go do as we talk about the biodiversity uh, convention that's going to happen this next year is that we need to change our relationship to the environment. We need to protect and conserve our ecosystems. So they provide the services that they do, they do today. Today, 96% of all mammals land mammals are humans or stuff humans eat. Only 4% of land mammals are wild. When I heard that data from National Geographic for the first time, I couldn't believe it. We've changed the, our relationship with the, the planet and we're suffering 
uh, this uh, decisions because we see zoonotic diseases less, such as coronavirus spread uh, time after time. Um, and we have Bruno here. Hi, Bruno, with a question from the Hi. community. Absolutely. Hello, Marcelo. Uh, there is first a question from Hello. Melissa Mahoney. Uh, she asks if you can expand on what the economic benefits of z net zero emissions uh, are, and especially could those benefits be the same for Chile and for other countries? Mm -hmm. Good. For example, when I, when I worked in the World Bank, we supported uh, Chile to look into the macroeconomic impacts of the net zero target. And it was shown that Chile will grow 4.4% more. So we turn the risk of climate change and we turn it into an opportunity of expanded growth. This manifests in lower transportation costs, lower uh, energy costs, and this makes the economy more competitive. The cost of, um, of uh, reaching the net zero target outweigh, uh, are much lower than the benefits that we uh, we'll have to to we'll reap. And we're not even talking about cleaner air benefits. We're talking about direct economic benefits of having increased investments, which is something that every country will require these years to recover from the COVID crisis and lower energy costs. So that's how it manifests. And, and this is a consensus today that we need to have more renewable energy because this is the way that we've had cleaner air and lower energy costs. There is another question uh, from someone in the audience asking, uh, countries across Latin America have very different attitudes on climate. Uh, can you comment on that? So Pew Research Center has been putting out uh, reports regarding what is the main uh, external threat that you have. And in Europe and the US, the biggest threat was either China or ISIS or some external bellicle threat. In Latin America and Africa, it's climate change, number one. And Chile is one of the highest with 86% of Chileans saying that climate change is the greatest external threat. So, and this is also very high across the, 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 the region. Uh, we could have populist governments coming in changing their priorities, but the reality is people are concerned because they see the threat of climate change every day. And regardless of whether the national government believes in it, climate change is real and is causing impacts and causing poverty in the region. Thank you, Marcelo. Back to you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. And, and Marcelo, just, you know, one last question before we actually um, say goodbye, which is it's just, you know, knowing that you were involved in the negotiations for the Paris Agreement. Are there things that you take from that experience that you can apply to this moment as we as we think about emerging from this crisis and coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, that there will there always be a populist that will be opposing climate action. And the way to get at this is to make the economic case. So regardless of what happens, there will be an economic case for spending on renewable energy. The US grew its in renewable energy investments around 40% last year. In Brazil, it grew almost 10%. And so therefore, if we're able to align the economic goals with climate goals, you will be able to make this uh, go forward. There's the national, the, the, um, the network of greening the financial system that is, puts together central bankers. The World Bank launched the Coalition of Finance Minister for Climate Action. These uh, are great efforts that will allow us to have the financial system support climate action because there's an economic benefit, because it's important for you, for your fiduciary responsibilities to disclose the risk you're, you have, both transitional and physical. And if we're able to do this, regardless of what the negotiations happen, you know, because there will always be uh, it, it, there, there will always be problems with the consensus. You will continue to have a resilient approach because climate action will continue because you can have the economic system support this. That's really great. Um, thank you so much, Marcelo, for being with us to share your perspective and your insight. It's um, really great to sort of zoom in on some of the things happening in Chile and, and how that might apply to all of us all over the world. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks.